Welcome everyone to the Fife Centre of Equalities Equality Hustings. Um, my name is uh, Sarah Jane Duncan. Um, a little bit about me is I just completed my third year of my MA Politics and International Relations degree at the University of Dundee. I am a volunteer and will be chairing the event this evening for you all. I would just like to take a moment um, to thank all the members of the audience and the candidates themselves um, for attending our first virtual hustings for the MSP elections 2021 and asking questions to their respective candidates regarding matters of equality. This event today is brought to you by the Fife Centre of Equalities. Fife Centre of Equalities, for those who don't know, its mission is to develop a harmonised approach to champion equality, diversity, inclusion and social justice. This is our first virtual hustings. The original event was supposed to take place at the same venue as the Oscars, but I guess teams will do. Um, we will be, there will be many different themes um, as this is a Scottish Parliament election, therefore we'll be looking at devolved matters rather than reserved matters for Westminster. I'll just, <coughs> pardon me. I'll just take a moment by introducing our candidates. We have Linda Holt from Alliance for Unity, Martin Keatons, an independent candidate, Bruce Henderson, Renew Scotland, Kathleen Leslie, Scottish Conservative and Unionist <laughs> Party, Julie McDougall, Scottish Labour Party, Alan Beale, Scottish Liberal Democrats, and David Torrance, the Scottish National Party. And we will be later joined by Neil Henry from the Alba Party. Aman Minzur Khan, Alliance for Unity, was not able to attend tonight due to commitment to religious duties on Ramadan. Um, we'll just take a moment to go through the house rules for this evening's um, debate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we welcome debate and different political opinions, but we also encourage all participants, candidates and audience members to respect each other. Each candidate will receive two minutes for opening statements. All questions are in groups of three. Each candidate will have three minutes to reply to the round. This means one minute per question. At the end of the session this evening, candidates will also be given three minutes for closing statements. I'll invite audience members to ask their submitted questions directly. If they are unable to or prefer not to be recorded, a member of the FCE staff will be able to read their question aloud instead. Please note, due to the time constraints this evening, we might not be able to answer all the questions put into the chat. If you have any specific questions for candidates, you can get in touch with them directly after the hustings. And then we will go on to Elric with our poll. Hi there, I'm just going to share my screen briefly. This um, is a poll of uh, people who applied, uh, people who could not make it tonight, and uh, people who just basically wanted to show their voting intentions. It shows their topics of interest and their initial voting uh, preferences. Uh, it's not complete, but this is give you a little idea of what we have at this time. So share the screen. And so you can see the quality topics uh, that really were ahead were definitely uh, health and social care and uh, participation. When we looked at uh, who, who, what the parties were actually prioritised, the intentions were really quite dominant for uh, the Sc Scottish National Party. Then it was followed by um, Scottish Labour and then uh, it more or less a kind of balance across the Scottish Greens. Which, uh, um, the none of the above was an option and over uh, that the person didn't actually say what they were voting for. So uh, this is not the number of voters, by the way, this is proportions, these are ratios. So that gives you a proportion of ratios. And this, this poll will be available online uh, continuously up to the elections as well as a uh, exit poll. Okay, that's me for now. 
Perfect, thank you, Elric. Um, we will now be moving on to opening statements from each candidate. As a reminder to each candidate, you will receive two minutes. I will warn you 30 seconds to the end and then at the end when your time is up. We have listed all the candidates by alphabetical order of their parties. We will order the, ans uh, the answers one to seven and then seven to one to mix it up. Um, we will now start with Linda Holt from Alliance from Unity. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. I'm Linda Holt. I've been a councillor in Fife for the East Newt since 2017, and I also do a bit of teaching and writing, as well as being a parent of three children. I'm the lead candidate for All for Unity for the Mid-Scotland and Fife region. I joined the party, this new party, very soon after George Galloway founded it last summer. The impulse behind it was very simple. The SNP has been able to subject Scotland to 14 years of sclerotic, independent, obsessed government, despite never winning a majority of votes, because the unionist vote is always hopelessly split. We can stop the SNP making it 19 years through an alliance for unity, as the party was originally called, by voting tactically in the constituencies and voting all for unity on the list vote. This would produce a majority of unionist MSPs who could form a coalition government of national unity. Sadly, none of the Westminster parties were prepared to throw their weight behind tactical voting by standing down no hope candidates in favour of the pro-UK candidate most likely to win in constituencies. So it's being left up to individual voters to adopt the tactical strategy. You can see the author unity argument winning through on social media, in the press and billboard campaigns where tactical voting has become the number one topic. The All for Unity strategy is the only way to stop the SNP and improve government in Scotland, to get off the hamster wheel of constitutional politics, or the never end, as George Galloway calls it, and so be able to focus our best energies on solving Scotland's problems. The nationalists' constitutional obsession means it hasn't had its eye on the ball for years. 30 seconds. On the issue of drug deaths, but on any domestic issue at all. The only ball that counts for the SNP is independence and how it increases support for that. Its approach is to, in government is to tread water and avoid doing anything which might upset people. I've had first-hand experience of that in Fife, which is ruled by a joint Labour SNP administration. All the innovative ideas and energy for improving life for Fifers have come from the Labour side. A central plank of all for Unity's manifesto is a Canada-style Clarity Act, which will basically set out the terms. Thank you so much, Linda. OK, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll now be moving on to... Um, Martin Keaton's the independent candidate for this evening. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Sarah and the rest of the team for setting up the hustings tonight. Now, unlike the other candidates, uh, it was a last minute thing for me, so I've not had an opportunity to actually prepare a statement. So what I'm saying will be off the cuff. This election is going to be one of the most important elections that voters in Scotland will ever have to take part in and it doesn't matter what your politics are all I would ask is that you do actually vote we're going to have a substantive situation with regards to post-covid recovery and um, the question of constitutionality uh, with regards to the independence question is obviously going to come up but mostly we are going to be in a situation where we have to start thinking differently about pretty much everything we have at the moment. Um, my only statement that I want to make is it doesn't matter who you vote for, just vote. And don't look at parties for the party's sake. Look at the candidates and what they stand for. Look at the parties and their manifestos and vote for what's best for you, your family and your local communities. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. We'll then be moving on to Bruce Henderson of Renew Scotland. Right, first of all, thanks very much for inviting us. It's nice to be included. A lot of these events uh, exclude a lot of the smaller parties. And I think inclusion is a very important subject. My background is largely in the voluntary sector. Uh, a lot of places around Fife from uh, Dunfermline to Bernarty to um, Kennaway to uh, Leavenmouth, 
and elsewhere in Scotland, Glasgow, Edinburgh, uh, the Lothians and so on. I'm a filmmaker and actor as well. Um, and I'm not really a career politician. I'm in my 50s. I'm not really looking to make a career of this. I've come into politics uh, because I'm fed up of the dishonesty and the corruption that exists in our um, in our political system. Uh, I agree with Martin there that we should be moving away from electing people just on the basis of party politics. We should be electing actual representatives. I did do some campaigning with Margaret MacDonald uh, and I'm very proud to do that. We need more Margaret MacDonalds in our parliament. The New Scotland itself uh, has four clear uh, areas of priority. First is ending poverty, not just tinkering with it, making allowances for it, but actually ending poverty. Uh, greater accountability, our Scottish Parliament election that we're having now, 42% of MSPs will be accountable to the party only. So taking power away from the people and giving it to the parties. Honest politics, including a criminal code. 30 seconds. Politics, including a criminal code for politics, where politicians are subject to a proper criminal system rather than just dealing with it inside the political bubble. Uh, and a Scottish protocol uh, so that as an interim until we rejoin the European Union, having a closer and more uh, engaged relationship with the European Union. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. And um, we'll then be moving on to Kathleen Leslie of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me to this. Um, I'm the Scottish Conservative councillor um, in Burnt Island, Kinghorn and West Kirkcaldy, and I also stood as the candidate in the general election in 2019. My campaign is very much based around local priorities in the constituency, which also feed into the national narrative here in Scotland. Local government is responsible for maintaining our roads, educating our children and waste management and recycling. That all, though, can only be done with proper funding. The Scottish Conservatives would introduce a communities bill to ensure our local councils receive fair funding, which from 20, 2007 to 2019, the Scottish government budget increased. However, the grant that came to local councils decreased. That needs to change. As your MP, MSP, I would be supporting the bill as I understand the difficulties of local government. Another one of my priorities would be to see Scotland's education system return to what it once was. Children have faced enormous disruption over the past year, and that is combined with worrying OECD data that demonstrates Scottish pupils only performing at the average in maths and below in science and achieving the lowest scores since first participating 20 years ago. The Scottish Conservatives would push for Scotland to rejoin international comparisons and also introduce a workforce strategy worth 550 million to recruit 3,000 new teachers and also put a STEM teacher in every primary school. Our UK's vaccination programme over the last few months has seen 2.6 million Scots now vaccinated, thank you, thanks to early procurement processes by the UK government. We're all aware though of the backlog and delays to operations and treatments, which has got much worse this year. The UK government has, de has delivered 13.3 billion additional funding to Scottish public services. Now, as we move forward in this election, there must be a full focus on recovery. If elected, that will be my focus for all constituents. Thank you. Thank you so much there, Kathleen. We'll then be moving on to Alan Beale of the, oh, sorry, Julie McDougall, pardon me there, of the Scottish Labour Party, once you're ready. I think you've, you're still muted there, Julie. Is that okay? Yeah, we can hear you now. Perfect. Well, that was yeah, that's great. Thank you. If you want to start now, that'd be great. Thank you. I just want to thank uh, Fife Equalities for inviting me along this evening and uh, to the Hustings. Um, I am actually standing as MSP for Dunfermline, but at the end of the day, I'm here to serve uh, the people of Fife and work with the communities in Fife. Uh, I'm standing in uh, on behalf of my colleague Claire Baker for, for tonight's meeting, so thank you very much. So I was asked last minute um, to come along and uh, I'd just like to give you a little bit about uh, what I believe needs to, to be happening. So I, I think that everybody has the ability um, to make a contribution in our society and regardless of gender, uh, sexual orientation, race, um, a religion, everyone has a, a, a way that they can contribute in some way in, in, in society. Um, no one should feel ever sort of left behind 
And I really think that especially the pandemic has shown us that it's a time where we all actually do need to pull together uh, more than really ever before. Um, so it's about making sure that everyone has access to the support that they might require so that they contribute in, in whichever way they possibly can. Um, as we go through the recovery, we're going to need to rebuild our society, um, our economy um, and NHS Fife, um, all, all the things that our priorities should be. If I'm elected as MSP in May, um, mm -hmm. my priority will be to ensure that there are sustainable opportunities for everyone and I will work collectively with local organisations such as Fife Equality Centre and work cross-party to ensure that we deliver the best for the people of Fife. So by working together at the grassroots up, we can rebuild our communities and live in a much fairer society. Thank you there. Uh, we'll then be moving on to Alan Beale of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Once you're ready. OK, thanks, Anne. Thanks for, for inviting me. Um, I'm Alan Beale, the Lib Dem candidate for Kikodi. Um, a bit about my background. Well, I've got science, engineering and environmental management degrees and chose to study environmental management over 25 years ago. And basically, I've been working in energy efficiency ever since. So I set up and ran the Tayside and Fife uh, Energy Advice Centre, which involved promoting and creating projects across Tayside and Fife. Uh, those with long memories may even have seen some of my letters and uh, articles in The Courier, but that was a long time ago. But since then, I worked as a housing consultant and now as an energy efficiency sort of software developer. Um, and in terms of the party, I'm really pleased that the centre set up its hustings, because I think equalities are one of our great strengths uh, as a Lib Dems. We've been at the forefront of promoting equalities for decades. For example, back in the day, we were first to commit to a sort of gay rights policy. We introduced gay uh, equal marriage in England and Wales and all women shortlists. Um, we've already unveiled quite a range of commitments to stop inequalities like pay audits of public bodies and, and agencies. But of course, we aren't just a party of equality. We want to focus on recovery. We've got to restructure the economy after the pandemic. So we'll encourage green industries like the uh, H100 Fife project, things like that, and we'll start reducing poverty. I mean, after 14 years of SNP rule, one in four households are in poverty. It's just unacceptable. Um, but we would start by doubling Scottish child payments to reduce that. Okay, we'd also tackle the climate emergency um, because we are part, we also believe in devolving power. Um, I think I'll just say in conclusion that we want to fix the country after 14 years of um, SP neglect, Brexit, and the pandemic. The last thing we need is an uh, independent referendum. What we want is to focus on the recovery so that we can build our country once again. And Lib Dems the power to do that. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much there, Alan. Um, we'll then be moving on to David Torrance of the Scotland, Scottish National Party. Once you're ready. Thank you and good evening and thank you for inviting to host us tonight. Um, I'm David Torrance. I have been the MSP for Kirkcaldy constituency for the last 10 years and I'm going to stand on my record tonight. I have been accessible to my constituents over the last 10 years. Last year, well, before the pandemic, I have held over 210 surgeries a year in every different community. And so the communities could come and speak to me or individuals could come and speak to me and I could take their problems forward. I pride myself on working with the third sector and also community organisations. And you just need to see a number of uh, boards that I am on locally, like the YM, Linton Lane, um, groups like that, could call the Ingolstadt Association, Leave Mouth Rail Campaign, Save Ancient Memes Cape Society. So I'm part of these communities. I know what these communities want and I could help them. So just have a look at the investment that the Scottish Parliament has put into the area over the last five years. And you get to look at BIFAB and the creation of 290 jobs there. Scottish Gas um, with a project which is world leading for hydrogen with £17 million investment. We allow that to go ahead within this constituency to be the first in the world to do it. And you need to look at the Leave Mouth Rail campaign. For 10 years, I have um, lobbied for it and worked with Leave Mouth Rail campaign um, to try and get this reinstated. And it resulted in 2019 with announcement from the Scottish Government of £80 million investment in the area, which will help connectivity, it will help job creation in the area, and it will help people with education. So we can 30 seconds. Um, thank you for that. Um, and on top of that, I just I, I look and think the record that we have in this area is really good. The investment, whether it's in social housing, whether it's in jobs, 
or whether it's in our local high streets, um, the record is very, very good. So I will stand on that and I'll stand on the work that I've done with the constituents over the last 10 years. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've also now been joined by um, Neil Hanvey of the Alba Party. Um, you have two minutes for your opening statement once you're ready, Neil. Thanks ever so much. Um, uh, uh, thanks for the uh, for making uh, space for me tonight. I'm very grateful. Um, I, I would like to just start off by talking about the Alba Party, uh, and um, it, it, it was established uh, to bring a much needed urgency to the timetable for delivering independence for Scotland. And the reason that's important is we face two um, significant threats at the moment: Brexit and COVID recovery. Uh, and it's only by seizing the opportunity of independence that we can um, uh, build a recovery that's meaningful uh, for our, the people of Scotland. Um, we want to maximise the uh, list vote uh, by building a pro-independent supermajority at Holyrood and to use our place as part of that supermajority to make absolutely sure there is no more backsliding on the timetable towards independence. As an Alba MSP, I would do everything uh, 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 that I can uh, and every day I'm in Parliament to press for um, a, a pro-independent Scottish government to make progress uh, on taking that forward. We've now got over 5,000 members and we're less than a month old uh, and we want to see something new in Hollywood and new in politics. Uh, we want to um, uh, uh, shake things up a bit uh, and uh, try and uh, see real meaningful um, uh, progress. Um, so uh, in, in terms of uh, where we are, we want to see Scotland where all people are equal before the law under a written constitution where the wealth of the nation is used to ensure that all our people flourish and reach their ambition and where the search for equality is reconciled with the hard won rights of everyone. Thank you so much there, Neil. Um, I would just like to say thank you to all of our candidates this evening for your opening statements. Um, we will now be moving on to the question rounds. The first round of questions are questions related to health and social care. We have a question from Ailish Hanlon about the national care system. Um, Ailish, would you like to be speaking yeah, hi there. So as we begin the COVID-19 recovery, would you support a national care system modelled on the NHS? If yes, why? And if no, why not? Thank you. Thank you very much, Eilish. Um, we also have a question from Kevin Barreto about mental health support during the pandemic. Kevin, would you like to speak? Um, I will get one if Elric or Lewis would be able to uh, read this question for us. Yeah, no problem. Uh, the, Kevin that, uh, the question that Kevin sent to us uh, was, uh, how will you ensure that people with severe social anxiety and other mental health difficulties receive the support that they need after the pandemic? Thank you. We also, our last question for this round is a question from um, Lissy Kopiek about party commitment to a social national social care service. Lissy, would you like to speak? Oh, we can't hear you. I think you're muted. <laughs> Don't know if we're able to unmute you there. We've not been able to unmute you there. Um, Elric or Lewis, would one of you be able to read the question on behalf of, behalf of Lissy, please? Uh, yep, that's not a problem. Uh, the question from Lissy uh, is... Sorry, you... I've, I've just managed to unmute Lissy. <laughs> Let's try oh. again, Lissy. Sorry. Uh, you, you have to click on your, your, your microphone at the top, Lissy. OK, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Back to you, Lewis, sorry, <laughs> I tried. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the question from Lisi is, will you put your party in place 
for a not-for-profit national care service. And you'll have three minutes to answer all three of these questions and we'll be starting with Linda Holt of Alliance for Unity. Once you're ready. Thank you. Um, I'm assuming that the first and second question, the first and last question are more or less the same about a um, national care system or national system for social care, which I completely and utterly support. I think I think we should have had it ages ago. And I think COVID has now, I mean, tragically, shamefully made it clear that that is the only way forward. I mean, it is we would never have had the number of people dying, who old people dying through COVID, the discharges from hospitals, untested into care homes, which killed so many people, and also just the very high fatalities generally in, in care homes and the terrible conditions that were going on in care homes if we had a national care social care system. So, you know, there, it, it's a no brainer. We've had in the past um, integrated or we have integrated joint boards for brought in at local authority level to integrate um, health care and social care so that we could stop bed blocking. Well, that they clearly haven't worked. They haven't worked because the SNP never put enough money into them because they regarded them as a cost cutting exercise. And I think we need to start again. Um, I, you know, interestingly, old people, I've worked in old people's homes. So um, this is something very close to my heart, are a hugely neglected minority. I mean, if the Fife Centre for Social Equalities, uh, Equality has wanted another job, I mean, I know you've got more than enough to do. Looking at the way that our society treats frail elderly people ought to be a, a really big priority because they can't speak for themselves. Um, so that's what I'd say about that. Um, in terms of mental health support, um, absolutely, I think there needs to be vastly more mental health support for, for not just for young people, but for everybody. Every party goes on about it in elections. The, so the Scottish Government goes on about it, wanting parity with physical health, but they don't actually put the money in. And even if you, um, you know, even in terms of physical health, getting to a GP, which is the first place that people go for mental health support, is incredibly difficult because we're 850 GPs short in Scotland. Um, waiting lists for mental health treatment when you get referred on by the GP are appalling and it's actually the length of the waiting list is an absolutely inhumane way of um, rationing treatment because basically doctors know or, or you know and managers know that people will get will get get better spontaneously or they they just give up or they or they end up 30 seconds um, you know getting ill with a, with a physical ailment or they end up dying and that's how we that's how we basically treat an awful lot of people with mental health. And I think um, that has totally got to stop. Just as we in our manifesto, the All for Unity manifesto, we call for a post COVID task force to um, clear the backlog of cancer treatments and operations. I also think we need a post COVID task force for mental health treatment so that the people who have been knocked sideways by COVID um, can get so the help they need. Thank you. Thank you. We'll then be moving on to Martin Keaton's independent candidate. Well, health and social care. Uh, you'll probably notice that um, because of certain attire I'm wearing right now that I am actually a carer. I'm a person with a disability, but I'm also a carer for my mother who's secondary progressive multiple sclerosis in advanced stages. Um, so in addition to that, uh, in my spare time, I also assist people with the DWP and with health and social care, filling in forms, appeals, all that sort of stuff. So you can pretty much see the experience I have of the social uh, care tree is uh, effectively people that have fallen out and hit every branch of the way down. If they end up b beside me uh, seeking my assistance, then every um, protection that's supposed to be built into the system has effectively failed them. So in this area, I have a wealth of experience. In terms of a national care service, yes, most definitely and equivocally, without a doubt, I would 100% support an NCS. No doubt in my mind it is required. Um, private facilities at the moment, I believe, should be nationalised. Simple as that. A lot of the deaths that have happened during this pandemic would never have happened if care homes were in private uh, hands. However, a lot of the issues we face are not actually to do with care homes and things like that, it's in home care. The facilities are substandard, they are lacking, uh, and there are too many people falling through the cracks. 
Um, as for carers, unpaid carers, well, I am an unpaid carer, so I understand straight away exactly what it's like to be an unpaid carer. Uh, and my view, in fact, one of the policies I'm running on is to fold carers rather than being on benefits into the national care system itself. Make them workers. Give them the protections of normal, uh, like the private and public sector counterparts. Give them the same protections, uh, those same protections to unpaid carers, the same training, the same availability. Fold them into the NCS. Make them employees. And you can read more about that um, in, in my manifesto, but that's fair enough. When it comes to the national care system itself, there are too many different disjointed and disconnected um, components to the system. Uh, there's not good enough communication between the, the, the systems that already exist, and that's where the focus seconds. needs to be in that communication between them. Uh, on the subject of social anxiety, well, it's going to be a big problem uh, and we need to be more proactive on this. At uh, the moment, the system waits for people to come to them. But at the end of COVID-19, we really need to be proactive and start going out and looking for people that are having issues, extend to them as many services as we possibly can uh, and give them th th remove so much, much of the Martin. stigma. Thank you. We'll then be moving on to Bruce Henderson of Renew Scotland. Um, first of all, on the National Care Service, we are very much in favour of a National Care Service. Um, my background has included uh, working with and for organisations that are involved in delivering or supporting care. Um, so I've seen some of this firsthand. Um, I can share an awful lot of what Martin has just said, uh, maybe not had the same life experience, but I've certainly seen an awful lot of uh, things that we need to change. And one of the um, huge weaknesses is that from local authority to local authority, from organisation to organisation and from sector to sector, there is a big difference in terms of how people interpret how social care uh, should be delivered and what they believe are the priorities around social care. I think National Care um, Service would help to change that and ensure there's some kind of consistency that operates across uh, Scotland. So that's the, the kind of um, the, the kind of big thing there. I think in terms of um, people suffering from severe anxiety, I know from my own personal experience, having spent most of the last year uh, a lot of the time at home, uh, I've actually developed a kind of semi-agrophobic thing myself. You know, normally I would be going out just to the shops and back and it's an interesting thing that, um, you know, for someone who's reasonably outgoing, that's a challenge for me now to feel that just going out normally is a small challenge. So people who already have anxiety, had anxiety before COVID, that's going to be an even bigger challenge. And I think we have a huge mental health time bomb that's been ticking away and it's been slowly seeping out long before COVID came along. And we have to recognise that if we want to help people move into employment and things like that, we're going to have to invest in build, rebuilding people's capacity, rebuilding people's confidence, and rebuilding people's um, sense of, um, of worth to be able to go out and engage in the wider world. And that's going to be from you know, people like me who maybe don't need a huge amount to other people who are, are need a lot more because the truth is there are an awful lot of people who don't fit neatly into our processes and systems. Government has a habit of having a one size fits all approach. And actually we're all individuals and one size fits all doesn't really cut it. So we need to be looking at how we tailor that, that help and support to seconds. people as well. Um, so I'm not actually going to go on much longer so you can, you can save some of the time there, Sarah. That's perfect. Thank you Thank so you. much there, Bruce. We'll then be moving on to Kathleen Leslie from the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, the question on um, mental health and looking at um, anxiety, obviously this past year has it's had a huge impact on people. I know um, people myself who, you know, I've never thought they would be seeking help for any of these issues until the, the restrictions and things of the past year. Um, so there, there is a huge pressure on our services. Um, Scottish Conservatives are committed to putting 10% of the frontline health budget 
into mental health services and definitely seeking to move more towards a community based approach. Um, I think sometimes people don't always know the signposting of how to access the help that is available. So definitely something that has to be far more into local communities, which, which I'm a big believer in that things should be as local as possible. In terms of the, the question on um, social care, um, at the moment, I would say I would probably share some of the concerns that I know that have been voiced by COSLA in terms of there's concerns around governance and accountability of that. And I think we really need to have some local accountability. So I definitely think that it's something that I think we need to know a little bit more about. I wouldn't want to see it. I wouldn't actually want to see things completely centralised. I think we have to be working with councils, families, local providers um, in terms of social care and how choices are made. Thank you. And um, we'll then be moving on to Julie McDougall of Scottish Labour Party. Hi, well, well as we know, the NHS is, um, is free at um, point of delivery and we already have a health and social care partnership in Fife um, where the system is integrated um, and does work well, but it could be more refined. Um, and I believe that we need to, as we go through the, the recovery, obviously we need to be looking at our services and looking at the areas where uh, it does actually need a little bit more attention um, and, and certainly health and social care as a partnership is working fairly well. But as I say, there could be a, a situation where you have a one point of contact, which would certainly improve the service. Um, I, I also think in terms of a national care service, well, absolutely, I completely agree, there should be a national care service. Um, the national social care, I, I, I believe, should be brought in line similar to nursing where uh, carers are treated as a as it's a professional um, position and paid accordingly. Um, so this should really be more professionalised so that it's a career option. Um, certainly our carers have absolutely worked very, very hard throughout this whole pandemic and they should be rightfully rewarded for that as well. Um, so I think we do have things in place, but there are there are always ways um, of, of improving that. Um, and, it, and it's our responsibility um, to ensure that we can provide um, a better integrated health and social care in Fife. And that certainly would be um, one of my priorities if I was successful in, um, in coming forward. Um, in terms of the mental health, um, Labour, we, we're very clear that um, there's, we're all aware there's going to be a lot more pressure um, on local GP services. Um, we plan and want to see uh, mental health services in every GP uh, surgery and um, certainly I'd be looking to to do my bit to try and ensure that that does happen in Fife um, and that people get the assistance and the support that they absolutely rightly deserve and, and mental health should be top of our, our priority um, and it's certainly something that has has been need, needed to be looked at for quite some time now um, so that will certainly be a priority for, for us but yeah um, and, and yeah, absolutely, the services can always be improved and I'll be doing my utmost to ensure that the health side of things and get the attention that I absolutely rightly deserves should I be elected in May. Thank you. Thank you so much there. We'll then be moving on to Alan Beale of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I mean, um, in terms of national care service, we've seen the issue with these big centralisation projects that the SNP has done. They don't work and they cost far more than they should do. So we think it should be a more localised service, but with national care standards and a national career structure. So that people working there are part of a, a larger um, organisation. But we think then it can be tailored to what people want in their local area rather than what's given to them top down from uh, um, Hollywood. We think GP should be empowered to refer people and just have more, um, more say in uh, in people's care. Um, in terms of mental health, we are well known for our policies on mental health. We've been going on about this for quite a long time, um, and you see this throughout our manifesto. And we really want to boost mental health in the health service. We want to have 50% of new health spending to be for uh, mental health and mental health practitioners in. GP surgeries, but we need further. We haven't got enough counsellors, so we provide grants for people to train as counsellors. 
um, and also put them in the workplace um, and even provide a sort of walk-in mental health services because we think it's so important that mental health is addressed and there's so many implications of poor mental health in business, education, people's um, a, a sort of um, welfare. So we think it's just something we have to encourage and we would do that if we could and we have done whenever we get a chance um, in previous years. Um, but obviously it's just not happening at the moment. Apparently there's only sort of five, as many um, community psychiatrists there were five years ago, which is just not acceptable. We've got to boost the number of people who are working with professionals in mental health. So I hope you can see our policies are really strongly behind encouraging better mental health services. Thanks. Thank you so much. We'll then be moving on to David Torrance of the Scottish National Party. Thank you, Sarah. Um, National Care Service, yes, I support it. As a member of the Health and Support Committee in the last session of Parliament, we did a very big inquiry into this in the care services, um, especially during the pandemic, the negatives and the positives. Um, so I'm very pro in favour of a National Care Service. If you look at the Scottish Government's uh, SNP's manifesto, um, it is there to create a National Care Service, and they're going to back it up by an extra 25% in funding for a social care service. So I'm fully supportive of it. On mental health, and um, we have I, there's always going to be because of the pandemic, there's going to be an increase in people needing support for this. And we have uh, recruited an additional 500 health workers. We've allocated 120 million pounds for a healthcare recovery plan, and we're looking to recruit an additional thousand staff in mental health by 2022. Just need to look at the policy of us um, putting a counsellor in. Uh, every high school um, because mental health is always not, not just adults and the first port of call is always in school for our pupils and they're probably the people we trust most so we're, we're doing that um, and the GP surgeries um, and it's interesting there because the, the, the health and support committee did an inquiry into this um, we're looking to put a dedicated mental health worker into every GP surgery that is in our manifesto but GC, GP surgeries need to become community hubs and there's great examples in Lovian where they have uh, adapted to that and they've become real hubs of where somebody comes in and it might not be a prescribed um, medication that they need. They actually is given to send them to Manchester clubs or out, the men's clubs or out to do um, exercise clubs like that and it helps their well-being and their mental health and as a Giving up time to GPs to concentrate on the real the cases which need the most attention um, and freed them up to give a lot of attention to them. So there's examples out there where it works really, really well when GPs become community hubs. And as I said, in our manifesto, we are going to give an, a mental health worker guaranteed to every one of the GP surgeries. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll then be moving on to Neil Hanvey of the Alba Party. Thank you, Sarah. Um, OK, so um, I'll start off with uh, the National Care Service. Um, I think uh, the point that Lisa makes is really important, which is that it should be uh, not for profit organisation. Um, profit um, uh, as a motivation for the provision of health and care is uh, simply, uh, I think, incompatible with the purposes of those services. So that's a really important point. Um, in terms of how a national care service is configured, I've got a substantial um, experience uh, and background in uh, the health sector as a nurse leader and um, cancer nurse, and also uh, more recently as a carer for my uh, elderly father um, who passed away last year. Um, and um, what I would say is that what we mustn't do when we talk about national care services, lose sight of the fundamental principles of the integration agenda, which was about putting the person at the centre of all of that, the activity around them and giving them a sense of control over what happens to them uh, uh, rather than um, it being decided for them. So that's really important. Um, the challenges that we've got, and I would just set this in the widest context, is that 
a lot of what what people talk about in the in in this um, area is a really tinkering around the the, the sides with small scale change. I think um, the Conservatives, Les Catherine Leslie mentioned moving ten percent from other frontline services into uh, mental health. Well, that's really robbing Peter to pay Paul. You need new money, and the reason there is no new money is that um, from twenty ten with austerity. Um, 12 billion was disinvested from uh, social care by the Conservatives in London, and that has an impact on Barnet Consequentials and the quality of funding in Scotland. And despite that, the Scottish Government have managed to make record levels of investment uh, 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 into health and social care. There's a required around about 14 to 16 billion investment just to bring those services down south back up to what they were in 2010. And that would have a real um, bonus for us if we were reliant on Barnet Consequentials. But there is another way, which is that we take charge of all of these things ourselves with independence and we design services that are fit for purpose for the needs of Scotland and not based on another country's expenditure. Um, uh, we need to be bold, ambitious, um, and we need to pay for that, not by increasing taxation generally, but by increasing the amount of taxpayers we have and job creation. Um, we need to consider uh, the, the fundamentals of social policy to improve well-being and mental health uh, through um, a range of different services. But uh, that is the best way that we um, move ourselves from a financial so career driven yes. society to a well-being based society. Thank you so much. We now have our second round of questions regarding education and young people. Um, we have a question from Joanna Pryor about employment for young people. Joanna, would you like to speak? Uh, unfortunately, Joanna couldn't make it tonight, so I will oh, okay. quickly read her question. Um, Joanna asks, under the current circumstances, there are many young people who have no or very little experience in the working environment who are currently struggling to get into work due to large volumes of more experienced workers applying for jobs that would normally be for younger people. This situation is undoubtedly difficult for all unemployed people, but young people without experience are particularly struggling to get a foothold. What, if you get elected, will you do to help young people in this situation? Thank you. Thank you so much there. Um, we have a question from Lisa MacDonald about blended learning, and I think that's been spoken on behalf of one of the SCE members. Yeah, I'm reading this one on behalf of Lisa. Uh, the question is, do you think blended learning should have been done in August last year, rather than sending all the children back in one go? Uh, as for me, as in Fife, where there was some quite, uh, there was some, uh, Ah, OK, that's because it was from areas in five that there was some really uh, high rates for, for students who tested positive with COVID. Thank you there. Um, and our last question for this round is a question from Anne Fallon about the attainment gap. Anne, would you like to speak? Yes, I think I've managed to unmute myself. Yeah, I can oh, hear you. You're oh. absolutely fine. <laughs> um, given that the leader of the Scottish Labour Party said that he'd done his best for his children's education by sending them to a private school. How would candidates seek to reduce the attainment gap and promote well-being amongst pupils in Scotland? Thank you so much there, Anne. Thanks for the questions of this round. I'll now ask the candidates to reply in three minutes. Um, I'll start with David Torrance of the SNP. Thank you, Sarah. Um, on the first one, on the jobs and job creation for young people, it's really important because I represent an area, and some of the areas I represent are in the top 10% areas of deprivation in the whole of Scotland. But job creation, especially for young people, is really, really important. And that's why the apprenticeship scheme and the number of apprentices that has been produced by the Scottish Government is important to areas like that because it gives them a foothold to get in. Um, but also, and I'll give you a best example is leaving my uh, college, the new campus that has been built there. They have got introductory courses to get um, teenagers or um, young adults back into education. Because you've got to remember in areas like that, a lot of these people had a real bad experience in education. 
and they left school with no qualifications or very little qualifications at all. So it's important that courses like that go ahead, get them back into education, encourage them back in so they could go on and do training in different areas. And the prime example is something like BIFAB, because there's loads of jobs there, but there is not the skills in the local economy. So we need to train people up to get these skills, to get these well-paid jobs, instead of bringing them up from the north of England to fill the posts. And that's why colleges like that are extremely important. Um, on the attainment gap, there has been progress made on the attainment gap. Not fast enough, um, I would probably agree there. But in our manifesto, we are um, allocating another billion pounds to try and reduce that attainment gap and recruit over an additional 3,500 teachers um, to try and close it as well. Um, and more classroom assistance, um, which will help with a uh, pupil ratio and the education standards of our young children that are there. Unblended learning, yes, I would probably agree. Uh, from all governments, there's probably been mistakes made during the pandemic, because it was a learning curve for everyone. Um, on blended learning back in August, I, I would have probably agree, yes, there should have been more of it instead of all the schools going back at once and to universities and the colleges, because you've seen a huge spike in the COVID cases and increases um, in the number of cases locally, especially in Fife, and especially around our, our universities and our colleges sector. So for me, yes, I probably agree, blended learning, learning should have been uh, brought in in August. Um, but as I said before, it's a learning curve for everybody who's in the government. I'm just trying to handle it. 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll then be moving on to Neil Hamby of the Alba Party. Sorry, I keep losing my cursor. I apologise. Um, I think when it comes to how we tackle young people, their achievement and their ambition, I think there's two particular strands I would like to identify. The first one is how we deal with life after COVID and the impact of COVID and its uh, effect on um, young people, uh, the work, working world, um, blended learning and the attainment gap. And then there's another strand which is the impact of poor social policy that has been in place since I was a wee lad uh, that limits ambition and drives poverty and deprivation and all of the things that we know have a direct impact on attainment uh, and uh, on um, uh, ambition and achievement. Um, I think in terms of the blended learning experience question, I think we could all look back on how things were done uh, in the early days of the pandemic and learn lessons. And certainly in our house, um, we really, we probably took a lot longer than we would have expected to, to get used to um, teaching as part of the normal day. Um, but we'd eventually got into, uh, into a good rhythm and uh, it worked out well. But in terms of that wider challenge, until we tackle things like um, poverty, uh, well-being, fitness, and I think that's going back to Kevin's question about mental health and well-being. One of the things that the other party want to see is the introduction of free access to sports for all young people to give them that sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, uh, all of the camaraderie that goes with team sports uh, and um, to enable them to have access to that without um, any uh, barrier of um, of cost uh, and and uh, on top of that we also want to see a doubling of the education um, maintenance allowance so that young people uh, are more are, are, are unable to stay in education uh, uh, and build their um, confidence but dealing with the COVID pandemic I think there's a real challenge there and it's how do we make the catching up of lost opportunity, uh, interesting and um, uh, available to young people. And I think there's a real challenge in the year uh, or two ahead where we try to develop strategies that engage young people, that enable them to catch up where they've missed out, not just in all of the social aspects of school, um, but where they are able to um, rebuild some of the lost education. Um, I think it's really important that we think very carefully about that because it's an investment for their future. Thank you so much there, Neil. We'll then move on to 
Alan Beale of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I mean, we totally understand this situation that young people have. They can't, they haven't got enough experience to um, to find work and the catch twenty two situation. I mean, this pandemic has just exacerbated that. It's made it so much worse for people and the young more than most. So we have got a few ideas on our manifesto in terms of what we would do to help young people. Um, firstly, we'd obviously strengthen education, give more power to colleges. Um, we would create 2,000 paid internships, for example, so graduates can get into onto the um, uh, paid work as well, but as well as expanding apprenticeships as well. Um, we'd also offer a job guarantee scheme for all 24 year olds or under so that they can access either a job or training guaranteed either of those two things. And I think it's a fantastic thing for all people in 24 they actually get what they need um, to, to get into the world of work. And I think that's a really good thing for um, under 24s to actually get. For older people, we'd also have a training bond so you can get money to actually train a new career. In terms of the attainment gap, I mean, obviously this is a scandal and the SNP has completely failed to uh, reduce this attainment gap um, despite having it been in power so, for so long. We would want to address that head on. We would expand the pupil equity fund so that money goes directly to schools in difficult areas for pupil support, one-to-one -one support, classroom support, whatever it takes to reduce the, the uh, attainment gap in those schools. Um, we'd give more money towards um, children with additional needs, help them. Um, so overall, we want to raise standards in the um, uh, school sector particularly, um, you know, other things like nursery premium and so on, which you don't probably go into now, but that these things start as soon as possible. Um, so I think that'd be the final thing on the um, blended learning is just we provide IT for all uh, pupils to, to, to help with that. OK, thanks. Thank you so much there. Uh, we'll then move on to Julie McDougall of the Scottish Labour Party. Um, well, as I, I said, that I believe that everyone can contribute um, in our society, but they need to have an opportunity to be able to do so. Um, and in order to do this, what we need to look at is maybe examples from other countries uh, where they fare well in their in their education system, uh, such as places like Sweden, and work on um, these areas in our education. With our, we need to work with our colleges, um, trade unions. Uh, employers and the government and all come together collectively so that we're looking at long term opportunities, sustainable opportunities, um, not just in the short term. Um, and our young people have been extremely um, let down. There is absolutely no doubt about that at all. And I, I really do feel for what, you know, what they are going through. Uh, we've all struggled, but they have absolutely been hit um, terribly. So there's so much to be done here. Um, and I think that we need to have um, some sort of contract as well, that when something does end, that we have other experienced workers that can then uh, renew their skills as well and not be left behind. So these are all things that need to be longer term. We're not just looking at six months. Um, what we are looking at is, is offering every youngster under the age of 25 an opportunity for at least six months. But we're looking beyond that and we're looking at ways of how we can work collectively with unions, colleges, education, um, and, and businesses to, to actually look further afield than that. Uh, in terms of attainment, there is an absolute digital divide um, and also a social divide. Um, and for some areas, it's, it's different. You can't just say one size fits all because clearly it doesn't. Um, in some areas, it might have been appropriate for the children to have gone back in August. In other areas, it might not have been appropriate for the children to go back. Um, you might have places where there are social issues and sad to say, but in some ways, domestic abuse. Um, every situation is different and it needs to be looked at that demographically. You can't make a one size fits all. It doesn't work. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done there. And the, ch the youngsters are the people that have been hit the worst. There's no there's no doubt. Spending on our education is a huge long term investment and should be absolute priority. Um, and Labour plan to employ more teachers. Um, every pupil should have a personal comeback plan and um, with a dedicated tutoring um, they get a chance for their exams to have a reset guarantee seconds. and everyone to have a digital advice in their hand. I've heard stories where people have not even had the facility to use that, which is an absolute disgrace. 
Um, but Fife have uh, want to put the resources, we want to ensure Fife have the resources to deliver education, which leads to jobs and long term opportunities for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll then be moving on to Kathleen Leslie of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party. Thank you. Um, in terms of the first um, question there about um, young people and apprenticeships, um, and the UK government put um, children £46 million to the Scottish government to grow apprenticeships. Um, we know that all of those, though, that money has not all been allocated at this point. But I think what we need to really think about is that it's going to take Scotland until at least 2024 to get to pre-pandemic um, economic recovery. So our focus should definitely be on recovery. And in terms of that, for young people, we know that young people are going to be most greatly affected coming out of school with uncertainty. So one of the things that Scottish Conservatives are looking for is it would be a more demand-led apprenticeship scheme where um, we would work with local employers to see where the needs actually are, the jobs that are available, and then to work between local employers and young people so that we're giving young people apprenticeships and training and skills that will actually lead to well-paid jobs afterwards. Um, in terms of the second question and the, the blended learning, um, I think it's something that this was a completely new situation that everybody was facing, um, not just here in the UK, but globally. So should we have gone to a blended learning approach um, back in August? Perhaps we should have in some areas and other areas it was not appropriate. I mean, you might have a um, school where people that are in an area with very low COVID levels, but you've got staff coming from elsewhere. So I think it's a, it was an approach that um, you don't have to be very careful with. But I think one of the things from that is, is really trying to get that digital connectivity, which there was a lot of holdups in terms of the devices coming from the SNP government actually to schools. Thankfully, here in Fife now, we are looking towards a policy where all pupils will um, have a digital device going forward. In terms of the attainment gap, um, well, to address that, we need to ensure things such as all pupils are able to take at least seven subjects in S4, which currently is not happening in all schools. It's not happening everywhere in Fife. Um, we also need to be recruiting more teachers. The number, the teacher numbers in Scotland have reduced over the last decade. The Scottish Conservatives are committed to um, committing another, uh, sorry, recruiting another um, 3,000 teachers, classroom assistants as well, and also having STEM teachers in every single primary school so pupils are introduced, introduced to STEM subjects at an early age um, and also be looking to put a billion pounds into attainment funding um, because I think certainly the amount of, um, I wouldn't say lost learning but the reduction in learning over the past year it's more vital than ever to ensure that we keep working to close that attainment gap. Thank you. Thank you so much there Kathleen. We'll then move on to Bruce Henderson of Renew Scotland. Um, OK, uh, quite a, a lot to deal with. Um, in terms of blended learning, should that have happened in August? I think one of the things that we recognise is that COVID was a fairly unique event. Uh, hopefully it's going to be uh, a, a unique event for the next few while, as in we won't have another thing like it. But I think blended learning is now something we need to look at how we develop and how we maximise the benefit from it. Um, I think it's fine to go back in hindsight and say, well, maybe we should have done this, maybe we should have done that. I think the reality is we need to kind of look forward as we go with that. In terms of young people into work, it's one of the challenges. It's the transition phase of a person going from school into adulthood. And I always think that's actually one of the most significant phases in anyone's life. Getting into employment is not just about taking your qualifications from high school and being able to then apply for jobs. Employers look for skills, they look for experience, they look for capacity, they look for references. And I think this is where maybe the voluntary sector has a much bigger role to play. And maybe we need to look at things like the Community Jobs Scotland scheme and expand that substantially and perhaps look at enhancing uh, a kind of small business community job Scotland scheme that is not quite the apprenticeship scheme but perhaps something uh, in between so that what we're creating then is a, a much more substantial um, capacity for young people to gain those skills and experience working with 
people and uh, having employer references, which makes a huge difference. And that maybe buys us time to invest in particularly in small businesses and local economies so that we try and create a kind of pipeline route uh, for that. I think there are probably a whole range of other things we need to look at as well. When we come to the attainment gap, I think one of the things that frustrates me, and it's one of the reasons I've kind of decided to get involved in politics, is that we continually talk about how do we close this attainment gap? And my view is that we will never close the attainment gap until we actually end poverty. We have to end poverty. And that is the only way we're going to close the attainment gap. You can throw as much money as you like at it. You will never close it until you end poverty, because that is what holds people back right from the start. Before they go to school, they do not have the opportunity and, and they will never have the opportunity to close the attainment gap. What's also been highlighted is the huge digital gap, which we've taken for granted. But I know from experience, there are huge numbers of people who don't have access to the internet. They can't afford the internet and so much stuff is going online. Thank you. Thank you so much there. We'll then be moving on to Martin Keaton's independent candidate. Um, it seems uh, we're going to, we're in, going forward in the last section and now we're going in the opposite direction with the candidates this time and Bruce agreed with me in the last the time and it looks like I'm going to agree with him here in terms of the attainment gap we cannot uh, we cannot uh, deal with the attainment gap until we end poverty in this country and there's absolutely no excuse for it we could easily introduce something like universal basic income uh, in order to be able to ensure that people's basic needs are met and many will say oh it's too expensive or oh the logistics are a nightmare and you know what you, you know what I would say to them well I'm sorry they're not excuses when you have children unable to feed their bellies when you have people unable to to go out and the, uh, by the basic necessities of life, when you have people making the choice between food and the choice between heat and light, I'm sorry, there is no excuses. It's government and parliament's job to protect those people. Simple as that. The attainment gap will never be solved until poverty is solved. It's simple as that. End of. In terms of uh, blended learning, I, I don't like to be the t Mr 2020 hindsight. Yes, we should have uh, went into blended learning a lot sooner than we actually did and to be perfectly honest with you that's more of a logistical issue that's an infrastructure issue if anybody had told you a year ago that we were there was going to be a virus rampage and across the planet that was trying to kill us all you'd probably have just laughed at them and suggested the stop watching outbreak uh, but the fact of the matter is this is a situation we find ourselves in the infrastructure wasn't able to sustain what had to happen and what going forward what we need to look at is how do we make our infrastructure as a whole more, more robust which ironically leads us into the first question about uh, youngsters that are unable to get jobs at the moment because th their jobs are being taken by those that are more experienced an infrastructure guaranteed work pro uh, work uh, guarantee scheme um, in order to update and change the way we think about our infrastructure in this country, how we deliver services and utilities, uh, uh, the whole raft, the whole infrastructure of our country. We get to work with new ideas, applying new technologies for that's fit for the 21st century. And what we do there is we create Perfect jobs seconds. for the youngsters so they are actually able to go into it. Along with it, you combine that with apprenticeships as well. Now you have people learning skills and as we begin to recover, they can then move out into the workplace as more jobs are created from that. So uh, all of these three questions are linked together. As simple as that. So thank you. Thank you so much. We'll then end this round with Linda Holt from Alliance for Unity. Thank you. Um, the first question about um, jobs for young people. Um, well, we want real jobs for young people and we're not going to get real jobs for young people unless we grow the economy. And so one of the things that All for Unity calls for is a small business recovery unit to help small businesses because they produce the most jobs in Scotland. And that means, you know, working much more closely with the government than small businesses have up to now or the government working more closely with them to make sure that the policy tax and regulation regimes align to create and grow small businesses. 
So that's the first thing. Obviously, we need to have massively increased training and funding to further education colleges needs to be increased. They need to be expanded. We need the job, the work guarantee scheme, apprenticeships, the whole lot. And it is incredibly depressing, I have to say, as someone who has got something to do with areas of multiple deprivation, despite being in East Nuke in Fife, to hear David Torrance's complacency about this, calling for more apprenticeships after 14 years. And all these young people in his constituency who cannot get jobs, who are coming out of school with no qualifications. You know, if I was part of the, of the, of the Scottish government, I would be so ashamed about that. And it is simply not good enough now to say, oh, we'll spend a little bit more money on this. You know, you have presided over so much misery and so many lost lives. In terms of blended learning, my answer is absolutely not. We should not have gone to blended learning in August. John Swinney was under a lot of pressure he, he, uh, from the unions to do blended learning, but he resisted that. And the reason that I say that is not just because the lockdown was, in, we have to balance harms, and the lockdown was incredibly hard, the first lockdown on kids. The second one was, was, was quite a lot easier because teachers were better prepared. But blended learning, we had two weeks of it just now. And my 13 year old daughter had a miserable time. She went to school and did Mickey Mouse lessons. The teachers were worked off their feet because basically with blended learning, they have to do two jobs. They have to prepare all the stuff for the kids who are working, learning online at home. And then they have to have tailor made lessons for the children at school. My daughter was put into to do French. She's never done French because it was just Mickey Mouse at school. It would have been a disaster to do that last August. And the other thing is that experience since then has shown that actually um, COVID infection in schools is not linked to community transmission nearly as much as it was assumed to be way back in the summer. So blended learning, I think, is a no-no. And, and I think we made the right decision in August. 30 seconds. In terms of reducing the attainment gap, um, I think we need to actually massive structural reform in education in Scotland. We've wasted a lot of money with um, the um, um, uh, free school meal money for uh, the PEF money. Um, we don't evaluate properly whether the projects work in school. We need to get rid of Education Scotland. We need a teacher led education body which identifies best practice and puts forward models which have been evaluated where actually um, the attainment of lower achieving pupils. Thank you so much, Linda. Thank you so much. Um, we've just got two more questions um, that I think are being read aloud by um, some FCE staff. No? no? Okay. <laughs> Don't know what's happened there. Um, no, sorry, I was I was just uh, trying to connect. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, what what uh, what it is that we are at the midpoint right now. So uh, we usually say that this is the digital well-being break of one or two minutes where you can put your screen off, have a stretch, walk around the chair and come back. We don't go away for too long. <laughs> and basically come back right now. We have two more rounds of questions after this. Perfect. Um, so this is our third round of um, the Hustons. Um, there's no, there's not a particular topic for this one. Um, we'll start with a question from Michael Cairns about the party commitment to veterans. Michael, would you like to ask your question? Is Michael here? Yeah, I'm here. Um, I think it was to switch your camera on so we can spotlight you. Okay, sure, no problem at all. Hi there. Uh, as you can probably see from my background, I run a, 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 a veterans mental health charity uh, and we're actually opening in the Linton Lane Centre soon. So in Kirkcaldy and we start on Monday next week. So uh, I'm an ex- Royal Marine myself and really yeah we just it's, like you said it's on and the question is the, the sort of commitment that you've got to veterans and looking after the veteran community in order to promote uh, or, 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 or not so much promote but try and prevent social isolation within the veteran community by helping other people like myself and charities like myself provide more breakfast cafe facilities hubs 
and just basically getting the veterans out of the house uh, and socialising uh, and help and not just veterans that have been outside for a long period of time but also veterans helping with that transition from military life to civilian life which is a stressful uh, process that I've just been through recently. Uh, I only left the Marines last in December and it was a hard process for me so luckily I had the support network with okay, the family. We'll to the answer, <laughs> We've got a second uh, question from Hassan Beg about the social centres for Muslim residents. Um, did, I'm not entirely too sure if Hassan had made it into the call because I know there was a few issues. Yes, I, I, I'm here. Oh perfect, would you like yes. to answer, uh, ask your question? Yes, uh, the question I want to ask uh, all the candidates is that FIVE does not have a community center for Muslims. How can you help in developing a community center for this substantial minority? Thank you so much. And we've got our, um, just a note for this one, Iman Manzur Khan also sent us a reply um, about this question which I'll just read aloud the now for you. Um, Muslims in Fife have five Islamic centres, mosques, two in Kirkcaldy, two in Glenrothes and one in Dunfermline. Besides religious activities, we have social activities as well in these small same centres. There is a need for one big property in Fife, which will be with easy access and approachable to all Fife Muslims for large functions like weddings and other festivals. And then we'll just go into the final question. This is a question from Alison Clyde about the intergenerational policy. Um, is Alison wanting to ask her question? Hi, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, research and evidence in intergenerational practice shows that there's real potential and positive impact in connecting younger and older generations um, for themselves and for our segregated society. How will your parties encourage and grow intergenerational work across Scotland over the next five years? Thank you so much, Alison. Um, thank you for this round of questions, everyone. I will now ask the, each candidate to reply in three minutes to all questions, and I will start with Linda Holt for Alliance of Unity. Thank you, Sarah. Um, the first question about veterans. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to hear. I, I didn't know that you'd set up a sort of self-help kind of shop or centre for um, people to, um, to combat social isolation and, and to help people making the transition, because I think that veterans. I think in general we don't treat veterans nearly well enough and um, so you could say they're another neglected minority really and you know they, they're a sort of a bit invisible because they're not the sort of people who be used to asking for help but clearly you know it's not just that it's pretty stressful <laughs> being in, in, in the services especially if you face um, combat and, and people come out with, with PTSD or mental health problems which is hardly surprising but the transition into civilian life I think is really tough especially for kids who've joined up at 16 and have basically gone from the family into an into the army and had ev and everything is done for them i mean i i have a friend who who, who said he, he was also in, in the marines and he said it was a real shock when he suddenly found he had to pay bills and deal with insurance and tax and and just these ordinary things and that's apart from relationships and having lost that structure and family of the, the army so i think um i think there needs to be a lot more support for for veterans when they come out and not just i imagine they get a little bit of stuff about transition but not just for a few months i mean i think it needs to be available for years i also think i have constituents who are who have horrible housing problems who've come out of the services and i think they ought to get um, priority on council housing lists i also think they ought to be able to jump healthcare queues they shouldn't have to wait three years for mental health support you know as the rest of us do so i i'm completely with you on the veterans um in terms of the um muslim um center um, that would accommodate all five Muslim communities in Fife, absolutely we should have that and I would fully support that. The Imam, the imam is, is second on, on the all community list and um, you know he does fantastic community work and um, I totally support that. I'm not quite sure what, what the government can do 
um, to, to help that, um, but it is something I, I support. Um, in terms of intergenerational, um, getting intergenerational mixing going, I totally support that as well. I think that um, the sort of tragic thing for old people very often is that they end up isolated and on their own. You know, family moves away, their friends die, um, and they're no longer connected to the community. And I think we could be creative um, and support voluntary organisations who connect old people more to the community. Um, in Fife, we've built um, a, care, a care home in Methyl with a nursery attached. Um, we're building a care home in a care village bang in the middle of the next to a playground in Anstrubba, um, which is trying to integrate old people. They shouldn't be isolated and locked away. They need to be integrated in our communities. Thank and you so much, Linda. I'll shut up now. Thank you. Thank you. We'll then move on to Martin Keaton's independent candidate. Uh, hi there. Um, the, I'm going to do this in a, a slightly different order here. Um, in terms of the, the Muslim community and a community centre, um, first, I want to actually take just a moment to say uh, the work that the Muslim community and Fife have been doing during this pandemic, uh, organisations like the AMC, absolutely fantastic. They've uh, been doing things like delivering food out to people that simply can't get out of their house. Um, couldn't sing their praises any more than that. Um, one way uh, to be able to enable a community centre is that each year the uh, Scottish Government publishes a list of abandoned properties uh, in right across Scotland um, and there's quite a few extensive properties in there. I see no reason why, why they couldn't allocate uh, a property of that type um, to the community in order for them to be able to set up their own uh, community centre. Uh, certainly granting funding for all, you know, for, to be able to enable that as well. Um, the, with regards to veterans, uh, I couldn't agree anymore. I'm actually from a family that has quite a few uh, military uh, individuals in it. Um, and the transition from military back to Civvy Street can be one of the, the hardest times for a soldier going from that sort of regimental um, regime that they have while they're in the military back out into effectively what is complete chaos. Um, with respect to veterans, the first thing I would be looking at doing is uh, trying to set up, uh, uh, trying to treat them uh, as we would, uh, like we were discharging patients from a hospital. So uh, proactive transfer of the files uh, and that sort of stuff to um, the NHS in the area that they're going to be moving to, um, the ability to uh, mark files for those that may have sustained uh, mental health issues in combat, PTSD, that sort of thing, in order that when they come out, there's a more proactive um, response for them and that they're prioritising the list to be able to, to, to get the access to services they need. In terms of housing, prioritisation on housing lists. Um, and I would also say as well that there, there should be an ability to um, give them extra funding for the first year outside of the armed forces to allow them to make that seconds. transition. Um, in terms of um, generational interchange, yep, I agree with it 100%. Um, activities like gardening, mentor programs, that sort of stuff. Um, the, the young generation has a lot to learn from the older generation and the older generation has uh, you know, an opportunity to, to live through the younger generation. So yeah, I fully support that. Thank you so much. We'll then move on to Bruce Henderson from Renewed Scotland. Um, thank you. I think um, I've never actually met Martin, but I'm going to agree with you again on a number of fronts on the terms of veterans. Our starting point is very much that government should have a clear core mission to ensure a decent basic quality of life for every man, woman and child. And that includes veterans. Um, and I think the Transition is a big challenge. I remember being part of the uh, Fife uh, Voluntary Sector Strategy Group a number of years ago, and we actually recruited uh, an ex-serviceman into the um, coordinator post. And we discovered that there is a big challenge going from something like the military into the voluntary sector. So I think we've got to look at ways in which people can um, not be thrown into uh, jobs. The, 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 the labour market, 
but look at ways in which people can ease in more. So maybe there are, maybe there needs to be a kind of voluntary sector or um, small business sector um, transition scheme where people actually go in and get work experience with not a huge expectation initially, or people adjust to a different environment. Uh, and I think part of that's about strengthening the sustainability of the voluntary sector uh, for those kind of um, projects. I think in terms of the social centre for Muslim residents, I don't have an issue with that at all. I think uh, where we create things, particularly after COVID, where people can come together once it's a lot safer to do so, uh, I think that's going to be really important. I think it's about looking at what is the appropriate place, uh, what are the appropriate requirements, and how do you then go about doing that? Where's the appropriate funding uh, and so on? I'm sure you've looked at a lot of that already. In terms of inter intergenerational work, I've actually been involved in intergenerational work. I remember being part of the pilot um, community planning in Edinburgh. Uh, I was working with a group of older people and we had another group of younger people. We brought them together for a number of projects and it's quite interesting to see how they um, perceived each other and how uh, each had different perceptions about each other that were not the case. Um, so I think there's a huge uh, opportunity there. Uh, and I think, again, it's about looking at how we engage with the education sector and the voluntary sector. I think the voluntary sector has a really, really important role to play over the next uh, few Sorry. years. Yeah, over the next few years. They had an important role to play before COVID. But I think the voluntary sector in Scotland is uh, one of the most creative and innovative, and we're going to have to look at investing in the voluntary sector uh, a lot more and rely on them to be a real key player uh, over the next few years. OK, thank you so much. We'll then move on to Kathleen Leslie of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party. Oh, I think you're muted. Thank you. Sorry, I've been having a bit of problems with the laptop here. No problem. Um, OK, well, the Scottish Conservatives um, very much support our armed forces and our veterans community, um, which is one of the reasons why we fought so hard um, at Westminster to ensure that our service personnel who live in Scotland would be compensated due to the SNP's higher tax ban here. In terms of our veteran communities, we would be looking to put forward in the next Parliament an armed forces and veterans bill. And that would be one where we would be topping up benefits for veteran households who are in receipt of universal credit and also a veterans help to buy scheme. Um, and also I'm very much in support of ensuring that for veterans, I know that I, I have friends, in fact, a couple of colleagues who are actually veterans and I'm aware of quite, quite often the difficulties in transitioning to civilian life. So very much so in support of ensuring that veterans do have that support when they do um, come out of the armed forces, obviously after this um, very important role they have been serving in. In terms of the, the question on the community um, centre for our Muslim community here in Fife, I actually asked a question at a recent um, Assets Committee at Fife Council on this because I had a religious minority group who were looking for um, an actual place to, to have their meetings. So I think that in terms of sort of policy, I'm not quite sure if um, if there is one. It's something I can look into. But I know that um, what I would certainly be saying is that approaching the local council, approach Fife Council in the first instance and see if there are any buildings that it may be possible to use, um, which you could actually purchase. In terms of intergenerational policy, um, prior to the pandemic, I um, went to a few meetings of generations working together. Um, and which was absolutely fascinating to learn about um, older people um, interacting with the uh, young children. I actually, my, I experienced this when my, my grandmother was in a care home and there was um, a nurse that was working very close with them. I think it's a fantastic thing to do. I think it absolutely has to be encouraged. Unfortunately, the last year has meant that all that has stopped. So I would be hoping that with the, the rollout of the vaccination scheme and as hopefully as things get back to normal, that we would be able to support that moving forward. Because I think both for young people and older people, it is, it's very important to develop that. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll move on to Julie McDougall, Scottish Labour Party. Thank you. 
Yeah, in terms of the veterans, I fully support that the veterans uh, absolutely need the, the support um, when they when they come back um, into normal home life. I think it's important not just for them, but for their families. It's a huge transition. Um, I do know um, a few veterans as well, and I have some uh, members of the family. And I think that um, we all understand that that, that is, is such an important um, support to, to offer. They have actually served us. And I think that we need to make sure that we, we pay that back. Um, and that might be from housing. Also, as we, we've mentioned already, the mental health services, the support services. And I think, again, it needs to be easily accessible um, because there is obviously a pride when, you, when you've done that type of work. It must be extremely difficult to come back and have to ha ask for any support. So it needs to be easily accessible, friendly, open, and we need to work with our communities and our veterans to make sure they're happy with how we're actually handling that. Um, I want to work with folks across faith, as I've mentioned earlier, and also when we're talking about um, other faiths uh, with the, the Muslim um, society, we're saying that um, absolutely, I completely agree. I think it would be great to have another facility in Fife and join this all together. Um, we have other facilities, as we've mentioned, in Glenrothes, on Fermland. So it makes absolute sense. Um, we have a huge community and I think those facilities would be absolutely welcome. That would be something I would fully support. Um, and and regeneration, um, reintegration, sorry, absolutely. Um, again, working with third sector, um, I, I look after a small charity that I look after. I know how difficult it is for the voluntary sector to, to try and get assistance and to try and get hold of funding and to make these things happen. I want to work collectively with third organisations and make sure that we're working collectively um, to ensure that these services are, um, are fit for purpose. Um, and that would be for all faiths as well, not just obviously Muslim, but obviously other faiths and faith. So there's so much work that we can we can do there. Um, Intergeneralisation. Oh, yes, I would say, yeah, um, I think we've learned something from the pandemic as well. Although we've not been able to be with family, we have learned how important community is and how important family is, if we didn't already know that. I'm, I'm fortunate I've, I've, I've spent quite a number of years overseas um, and I know how different we can be sort of with European culture is different. We can learn a lot from that. So I really do believe, again, that the, this is an opportunity now after the pandemic, as we come through it, that we learn things from our families about reconnecting. And certainly it's a great time uh, to, to reevaluate there. So I'm all for that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll then move on to Alan Beale, Scottish Liberal Democrats. Thanks. Yeah. Um, in terms of the veteran issue, like again, some people in the panel, I mean, I've sort of a fair bit of experience um, in terms of this. Um, people I've known who've been veterans. I mean, when I lived in a night shelter, the vast majority of people, about 78% of people, were people who came from the forces and they ended up on the streets and then into, into our shelter. And, you know, that's because they had given, been given no preparation to prepare for the sort of life in, in the sort of, in, in civvies. And, you know, that's a big issue. That's still, I'm sure it's better now, but I mean, it's just, that's fundamental that, that people need help. That's again, that's probably reserved matter coming from um, the army. But homelessness is something we can stop by having a decent homeless policy, which is again what, what we're proposing in our policy. Um, that's a safety net for everyone and they should be the last people on the streets. Um, also, again, the issues that have been raised also show the fact there's big gaps in mental health provision at the moment. That hasn't, it hasn't happened. I mean, um, I think you can combat stress, which is a kind of post-traumatic stress, as only, only came about relatively recently but massive gaps in mental health for people who need it and that's what again our policies help bring those things out so there are walking places they can go to get help when they need it because they need it quite quickly in some situations um so again i think that that would be um good for for veterans uh, um, in terms of the social center it's, i love seeing sort of community projects coming up and being driven for the community creating new things and again i hope that would be I'm sure most people sympathise the objectives, but obviously the funding is a is a different issue. I can't imagine many parties got particular pots of money for community centres, but again, um, with a better economy, there's more more money there potentially to be used. Um, in terms of the intergenerational question, yeah, fantastic thing to do for everybody's uh, point of view. It gives um, youngsters a bit of perspective, gives older people um, you know uh, an interest, um, but it's all about volunteering. 
and people can only volunteer if they've got decent pensions and if they're not having to work all the time, um, as well as having a structure for sort of get, putting people in touch with each other. So, um, yeah, great thing we can encourage that. Be uh, um, fantastic. Um, yeah, that's thanks so much. Thank you so much. We'll move on to David Torrance, Scottish National Party. Thank you, Sarah. Um, can I say first on the veterans question? This is something that's very personal to me. And can I also say welcome to Link Lane Centre as a board member. I'm sure you'll find the facilities excellent and Mandy and her team more than accommodating for you. Um, I have both my sons in the armed forces, both in the army. Um, and this is very, very personal. My first one after his tour to Afghanistan suffered from PTSD and I had to pay for um, counselling privately. It was that bad. He left the army could not cope and re-signed to go back into the Black Watch um, because he just there was no transition there at all. And this is where I think that um, not only governments, but the armed forces have to take responsibility as well. They have to put resources in there so anybody leaving the forces or anybody suffering from PT PTSD is um, being able to give the help that they need. Because I have watched it with one of my sons, and it was it was absolutely soul destroying to watch what he went through, um, screaming and shouting in the night after his first coming back from his first tour in Afghanistan. Absolutely broke my heart to watch it, and and to see it there was no help there at all um, really upset me, and I had to pay for it privately, as I says. So charities in the third sector are really important in helping these armed forces, the armed forces veterans coming out, um, not only in learning social skills. Um, but in the, the, the whole budget in this that has been mentioned before, and most of them are coming out with stress, suffered from, and especially the Afghanistan veterans, and stress suffered from what they have seen out there. And there needs to be services put in straight away, because if you catch it early, you're able to help the individual, you're able to help that person, and you're able to help them rebuild their life. And that is really, really important. And I watched that and how it was so effective with with uh, Kinnan as well. I've named him so with Kinnan. Um, it was so effective. Um, and he was back. And he's, he's back in the armed forces because he could not cope with the outside world. And he's really, really enjoying it. Um, so I, I won't take it away from it. So the third sector, voluntary sector, is so important in providing these services um, for individuals leaving the forces. On the 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 Community Centre for the Muslim um, Community. Can I say first? As somebody 30 who, seconds. Uh, sorry. Um, there is halls out there, and I could give you an example. In Kirkcaldy, we have the Arabic Society. They have a hall that was given by a nominal fee from the council because it was a surplus requirement property. So the Muslim community should look at what Five Council has and try and purchase it because it will be done cheap. And on, on a intergenerational working, there's great examples out there in the third sector. Um, uh, young people working with older people and taking part in sport and learning as well. Um, and also awards. Thank you so much, David. OK. Go. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll then move on to Neil Hanvey of the Alba Party. Thanks very much. Um, uh, again, Sarah. So um, in terms of um, intergenerational work, this is something that I've got experience of, um, both with the uh, working with generations working together, um, uh, which is um, uh, uh, led by George Kay and various others. And uh, there's uh, some fantastic work being done at Benicky Church um, that's related to, um, to their activity. Uh, great project. Um, we had that Kind of situation in our house when my dad was living with us was my dad there was us and there was the kids and it was brilliant because although the boys got lots of intergenerational stuff with the care home near the primary school when they were there being able to come home and do their world war ii projects and talk to my dad about uh, the anderson shelter and the bottom of their garden and the bombing of belfast during the war and of glasgow and um, that was uh, that that was really invaluable so there's real nuggets of treasure at intergenerational work and um, with regards to the um, uh, social uh, center for um, the uh, Islamic faith I, I think there's a, a big question that we need to ask about 
uh, inter, uh, interfaith work and a much more visible presence of interfaith work. Um, and I think that we don't invest in these kind of projects um, because uh, everybody expects to get everything for free. Uh, I'm not talking about the um, the the uh, uh, um, the, Mus uh, the, the Muslim centres at all. I, I'd love to see that happen. But I think that, you know, you have to pay your taxes to make these things happen. Uh, and uh, I think that we need to start asking questions about how we improve uh, the number of people in work uh, and paying taxes uh, uh, to make those kind of projects really come to life. Um, and the last one I'm going to talk about is veterans. And uh, the reason I'm leaving it to last is because I, I'd like to talk about that most because there's really something very wrong in a country that talks about people as heroes uh, and puts them on a pedestal, but only does that uh, when they're wearing a poppy or uh, on, on Remembering Sunday. I, I just find it all a little bit hypocritical um, and I know that people are really well meaning but actually PTSD is not just four letters it's a seriously debilitating illness um, and it's very easy to write write veterans uh, adjustment off it is absolutely life-changing and it goes on forever as a pal of mine who was in the Falklands war still suffers from PTSD to this day and still suffers with um, the impact of that conflict. So there's a real issue which is properly funding so much, veterans um, uh, recovery. Uh, can I just quickly say, Sarah, I'm going to have to go because I've got another uh, meeting that I need to be at. So can I uh, say thank you very much now um, uh, so that I can head off for my other meeting? And I apologise for having to leave early. It's just uh, I've got another media event. It's no bother. Okay, thanks to everyone for uh, their contribution. It's been really, really enjoyable. Thanks a lot. Bye now. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like we'll just run slightly over, um, but the questions and discussion are worth staying for. So please bear with us while we're more likely to finish around about 10 past eight. Um, We've got a question from Craig Duncan about rural infrastructure. Craig, would you like to ask your question? No, I'll get somebody from the SCE to ask a, on behalf of Craig. Yeah, that's no bother. Um, Craig's question is, um, right now, rural areas are stuck with whatever network speeds BT decide to invest in or pay through the nose for high speed internet from Virgin. Is there anything you could do to improve the current situation? Thank you so much for your question, Craig. We have one last question from Judy Hamilton about the supermajority and is for a named candidate. Is a uh, Judy Hamilton here would like to ask her question? Uh, I think Judy has not been able to connect, so I'll just read a question on the behalf. I think it will be easiest because I've tried to fix it, but it's difficult. So uh, a question from Judy was, um, uh, Neil Henve, Alba candidate, has specifically said that he will work with David Torrance to promote the supermajority and ask questions to vote for SNP on the constituency vote and for the Alba in the regional vote. Uh, my question, Judy Hamilton's question, is to David Torrance to ask if he worked with Neil Handley towards his hand and so it's aimed at a, talk, at a candidate for this one. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for this round of questions. I'll now ask the candidates again to reply within three minutes and I'll start with this one with David Torrance of the Scottish Nationalist Party. Thank you, Sarah. Um, on Judy Hamilton's question, very short. I'm supporting both votes SNP. I'm not supporting Alba, and that's the end of the story, OK? Um, on the rural and connectivity and broadband speeds, um, you just need to have a look at places like Ofter 2 in my constituency um, who struggle businesses to get it. Um, the Scottish Government is committed to getting super fast broadband to every household, um, whether it's islands, rural, or in town um, in the next three years. 
Um, they've managed to they managed to reach 94 percent of our population so far, and they have invested hundreds of millions of pounds in this. So it shows that we take this seriously, um, and we are trying to get there because it supports. And a lot of businesses are run from houses, small businesses. So it's important for them to have that fast broadband connection. And in the rural economy, there are so many different and diverse um, tourist industries there that need it as well. So it's important that we do connect them. And that it's one of the major uh, for the economic recovery that the Scottish Government's looking at seriously in the SNP. Thank you so much. We'll now move on to Alan Beal of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Okay, thanks, Alan. Um, yeah, we very much appreciate the fact that high broadband speeds are critical for productivity, for business, for, edu for education. It's so important now, and even the viability of rural life. So, you know, the pandemic has shown that to be even more the case. Um, so. And I've also heard stories about people having to pay thousands of pounds to connect to broadband service it isn't even very good. So yes, we are aware of this and we would establish a network of community connection managers who would broker solutions for local communities. And we think that's a really good way of solving the issue rather than leaving it to a monopoly supplier to do it, to provide solutions, because obviously they aren't doing it. I mean, the SNP promised to get full broadband by 2021, the Tories by 2025. Well, they haven't happened. Um, so we need to get some special measures in place that are actually going to mean that um, high speed broadband can reach these areas um, because, say, it's, it's so important for, for, for lots of reasons. Um, I mean, even in cities, it's it's not as good as it could be in some places, um, but rural, rural broadband could be improved significantly. So I think that's the answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll then move on to Julie McDougall of Scottish Labour Party. Yeah, um, I think we we understand now how crucial the internet is. Certainly, over the last year, we wouldn't even be holding the hustings tonight, obviously, without it. Um, so that it's as important now, really, as electricity, gas, telecommunications, um, roads, and railways, pretty much. So. Um, it not only sustains our family contact and it's a social aspect and um, obviously a lot of businesses are run through through the, with the form of internet so it is absolutely crucial that a lot of these rural areas have um, the infrastructure and, and the internet connection required. I was on a recent meeting with uh, Chamber of Commerce, I'm aware of the issues that are in Fife, um, I listened into the meeting um, I know that there are plans to do this but again it's more about getting the infrastructure in place so yeah, in this day and age, it's an absolute necessity that we've got it. It has to be yet another priority, um, but we need to get the infrastructure in place and ensure that every single household in Fife has absolutely excellent communication with our internet. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll then move on to Kathleen Leslie of the Scottish Conservative and New Unis Party. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, rural broadband. I think it's um, something that I think we can say politicians of all parties have spoken about the need um, to get that. But I think really the past year has demonstrated that talking about it is not enough. It is absolutely essential um, from young people who at the start of the pandemic were working at home and didn't always have a great um, broadband connection in rural areas to the amount of us who are also working from home and the number of new small business owners. So it's absolutely essential everybody has that. I'm pleased to see that the Scottish Conservatives have got that definitely as one of their, their key priorities for the election. So, yep, I would definitely be, be supporting that. Any moves, well, really getting the whole thing speeded up. Excuse the pun. Thank you so much. We'll move on to Bruce Henderson of Renew Scotland. Um, I think um, I live in Dunfermline and I know that I can't get super fast broadband in Dunfermline. So if I can't get it in somewhere like Dunfermline, which is a fairly major metropolis in, in Fife, then the rural uh, end is, is, is obviously much poorer. The weakness, of course, is that the distribution side of the network is largely still ADSL, two wires. And the priority has been to get the distribution side from the exchange out uh, to be more the, the, the kind of super fast broadband bit. The bit that annoys me intensely, however, is way back in the day 
when there was British Telecom and Mer uh, sorry, Mercury and so on, the proposition was that these companies should work together to put the new um, broadband plant in the ground. And the Conservative government at the time said no. And I reckon that's knocked us back by about 10 years in terms of putting fibre optics and things in the ground. So if we can, you know, that we could have been a lot further on if politicians had stayed out of it and allowed the businesses to pursue the business case. And the problem now, of course, is that we've got lots of areas demanding to have access to the internet and access to high speed internet uh, and high speed broadband. And it's going to take us a lot longer than people have suggested. I think what ha has happened is people have had wishful thinking when they've said we're going to do it by this date and by 2025 or whatever. Reality is there's a lot of old plants still in the ground and that unless we find a way in which we invest in that, because BT aren't going to do it on their own, they're a commercial business, they're not a public service. I think we have to be clear about that. Um, so I think it's about being, politicians need to be realistic and British Telecom have to be realistic about when this plant is actually going to go into the ground. Because I think up until now, people have been fanciful in their predictions. Uh, and I think it's something that we need to change. Thank you so much. We'll then move on to um, Martin Keaton, the independent candidate. Um, I know this was a, a directed question for David. Um, however, I do have to say that I'm slightly disappointed that his response. The question to him was, would he work with Neil if uh, Neil was elected? He didn't ask, would he vote for Neil? He asked him if he would work with him. And I just want to opine, short comment on this and say, when you're elected to Parliament, it doesn't matter what your feelings are about the people across the aisle from you. You have a duty and a responsibility to work with them because the electorate decided they were going to be in Parliament with you. That's not something that should be a personal choice. The only question that should be asked when a policy is put forward is, is this going to benefit my local community? And if the answer is yes, then you have a responsibility to work with them. Um, now, on the issue of broadband, this is actually one of my wheelhouses. I used to be a broadband engineer, um, so I know quite a bit about it. Um, the issue with broadband is a case of we are over-reliant on BT open reach to roll out the network. But at the same time as well, private companies are unwilling to roll their networks out because the cost is simply too great because the infrastructure isn't there. We have to start by digging up the streets and putting in tunnels that allow easy access for utility providers to be able to roll out whatever the heck they want, to be able to upgrade whatever the heck they want, when they want at any time. That's where it needs to start. We put in those tunnels, which by the way, local councils could actually lease to companies, um, thereby creating a local, uh, a local uh, revenue generation. Um, if we put in those tunnels, we put in those uh, underground conduits, then private companies would be more than willing to bring hyper-fast hyper broadband, your Vodafones, um, your uh, the Energis, your uh, um, even OpenReach would use them as well. Um, but there would be multiple companies would be willing to do it because they wouldn't be having to pay to dig up the street constantly in order to put the cables in. The conduits would be ready there for them and that takes us back to the conversation we had earlier about upgrading our infrastructure and creating jobs. That could be part of our pre-COVID response. Um, Ultimately, it comes down to the rollout is too expensive, so the private companies look for highly populated areas and isolate uh, rural areas, or they're not economically viable. And then at the end of the day, we're left with a situation whereby um, those communities never get the upgrade, and they're sometimes two, three, four seconds. generations behind. Uh, so by creating the infrastructure to allow the rollout of that broadband, we would inject more competition in because companies would be more willing to roll out to more rural areas because they're not having to dig anything up. It really is that simple. And councils could make some money out of it as well. Thank you so much. We'll then move on to Linda Hall Alliance for Unity. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I was amused to hear again David Torrance talk about the SNP commitment to superfast broadband because the question really is why on earth have, hasn't this happened up to now? And Bruce is completely right that we Basically, government has relied on private providers and private providers have failed. 
there's a kind of voucher scheme, but it doesn't nearly begin to pay for the cost of connection if you live outside of a, of a city or conurbation. So the private providers have picked off the low hanging fruit, but places like, like the East New Northeast Five rural places, people are left hanging. Um, luckily, I mean, amazingly, in Scotland, in Fife, we, are, we have the only digital improvement district in Scotland, which is in Cooper. And I would recommend all of you, please, to Google Cooper Now and look up about what Cooper Now has done as a digital improvement district. This is a kind of version of a business improvement district where they have a levy on local businesses. They get a grant from Fife Council. They get a grant from the Scottish government. And what they have set up there is super fast broadband for people using new technology, which is, doesn't rely on digging up the ground. It's Wi-Fi. It's Wi-Fi networks. So it's what you have in your house. They can do over a distance of seven kilometers. And that was so, and, and on the back of that, they set up a fantastic community internet kind of social media network as well, which they got free on, on, on the back of this. It's been an amazing project. It is tragic that this hasn't been rolled out across Scotland. It hasn't been rolled out because of basically a lack of interest in, by the Scottish government and huge bureaucratic hurdles. However, the people who did Cooper Now I've got a vision. Well, because people contact them from across North East Fife saying, can we have what they've got in Cooper now? Can you connect us? They have now um, scoped out a project for the whole of North East Fife and including two wards in Leavenmouth and which would um, not it would not rely on Scottish government funding. It's going to it wants to bid to the UK government's levelling up fund via Fife Council. To run this this project and the the to build this Wi-Fi network for super fast broadband across North East Fife and Leaven and part of Leaven Mouth, and then the that would be owned by a community trust, so it'd be a community asset, which you know the community could choose to use the revenue from or sell later on, whatever. And on the back of that would also be this incredible community information network. It is an amazing project. I'm very lucky to have it. So please look at Cooper now. There is a future, but it's not going for super fast broadband. But it is not going to happen by digging up streets. That is now old technology. Thank you so much. Um, I would just like to say thank you for all the um, questions this evening, and um, we will now be moving to closing statements. Um, during this time, you can now take part in the poll. Pl Posted, sorry, posted in the chat. Um, it will run until we finish to all the closing statements. And we'll start the closing statement, uh, which you will all get two minutes each. We'll start with Linda Hall, Alliance for Unity. Me again. Right, yes. well, um, <laughs> I suppose, I mean, I should, it should be clear to you all why I'm standing as a candidate, and it's because I'm really, really fed up with the SNP and the government we've had with their over-promising and their massive, massive under-delivering. It makes me quite literally cry. I've got a daughter who is on the autistic spectrum and has additional support needs at school. I've been trying to get a diagnosis for her for four years, and it's going to be at least another year because this is the way the NHS rations access to its usually oversubscribed, oversubscribed mental health services. She's never had the help she needs at school. She's 13 now, and I see her leaving school with few qualifications and not much chance for a job. And she's one of the lucky ones, actually, because she's got educated, relatively well-off parents who are going the extra mile. I also founded an addiction self-help group in the East Nuke because the complete lack of drug support services up here was seeing young men in their 20s dying, and the community felt utterly helpless. One of the things I like about All for Unity is that it's a genuinely Scottish party and truly nationalist in wanting the best for Scotland. It differs from the SNP in that we are single minded in wanting to make the absolute best we can of devolution, something I don't think any party has done in Scotland since Hollywood was founded. All for Unity differs from the mainstream parties because it is entirely free to do the best for Scotland. It's not having its strings pulled by a mothership party in London. It doesn't have to worry about advocating a policy for Scotland on an issue that conflicts with the policy in England. All for Unity can put Scotland, what's best for Scotland, first and last. So what we're asking for on the 6th of May is for you to lend your first vote to the pro-UK candidate most likely to win the constituency, which everywhere in Fife is Labour, except where it's Lib Dem, and lend your second vote to All for Unity in the regional ballot or the orange paper. A list vote for a party which is not standing in constituencies automatically counts for more than a list vote for a party which wins constituency votes. And this is the best way of maximising the number of unionist MSPs returned to Hollywood. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll then be moving on to Martin Keatons, the independent candidate. Um, as I said at the start of this, uh, I only had a few hours notice before coming on here, so pretty much everything I've said during this call has been ad hoc um, and off the cuff. Um, we are coming up to probably one of the most poignant elections that Scotland's ever had. It's going to be one of the most, uh, it's going to be certainly one of the, the, the most different um, elections we've ever had. It's 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 going to be fundamental to how we proceed as a nation uh, and how we recover from the current circumstances that we find ourselves in uh, now. One benefit I have of, of being an independent is that um, I only have to really have one policy and that policy is a question. Um, does this benefit the people in Mid Scotland and Fife? That's it. There's no party whip telling me what to do or threats of deselection if I don't do it. I simply have to ask one question. Is this going to benefit the people around me? And if it does, support it. If it doesn't, then don't. It's really that simple. When I, I, I'm asking for a vote on the regional list. I'm asking for you, for you to vote for your, your own party that you support on the constituency ballot for myself on the list. And I'm doing that because I, I want to go to Holyrood to try and make a substantive change. Now, I'm a, I'm a carer. I'm a carer. So when I go into that chamber, I'm not going as is somebody that possibly understands what carers are going through. I'm going in there as a carer because I do understand what people have been going through. I do understand what carers. We've been abandoned during this election. Maybe it's been, been abandoned during this, this uh, pandemic. Uh, things need to change and I want to go to Holyrood to try and change them. So I'm asking for your vote. If you Thanks. choose to give me it, I'll try to live up to the, the trust you put in me. Thank you. Thank you so much. We then move on to we then move on to um, Bruce Henderson of Renew Scotland. Thanks. First of all, thank you for including myself and the smaller parties. Uh, I think it's great to be included. Um, uh, just to uh, clarify, the Renew Scotland is fairly autonomous. We operate fairly autonomously, but we work collectively with the Renew Party in the UK. Um, we're not answerable to the Renew Party as such. We are. We also don't operate a whip system. So even if a group of us are elected and we have a difference of view, we will vote according to our conscience and that's about having new politics and it's moving away from the vote for the the voting fodder which is what the old politics has been about um, fundamental to uh, change is ending poverty and we're absolutely clear ending poverty stretches across so many aspects of public policy and we need to do that otherwise there are lots of things we will simply never achieve no matter what is promised we want greater accountability. We want honest politics with a criminal code to back that up. We want a Scottish protocol so we have a strong connection with the European Union. And we want to look at how we make the voluntary sector more sustainable. Politicians talk about this all the time. And having come from the voluntary sector, and I refuse to use the word third sector because the voluntary sector is not third at anything. Um, I'm absolutely clear that the voluntary sector has a huge role to play over the, the coming months seconds. and coming years. So I'm going to ask you to vote on the uh, second ballot on the regional list for Renew and try and help us to change our politics as well as uh, push the idea that we actually end poverty. Because without that, I think we're just going to go round and round and round in circles, election after election. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll then move on to Kathleen Leslie of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party. Thank you and thank you for having me at this event this evening. Um, my campaign is based around five key elements. Um, the first three are national ones, which is backing our police um, to be tackling crime, antisocial behaviour, vandalism in our communities. And we would do that through a local policing act, which we desperately need. My second pledge, which again is a national one, would be restoring standards in Scottish education, which would mean um, recruiting another 3,000 teachers and introducing larger subject choice. 
I would also, um, as one of our policies, be supporting greater investment into our NHS as we recover from the pandemic, because we know there is a huge backlog in terms of diagnosis and treatment. My next two um, pledges, if elected, are more local but do feed into the national story. And one of those is to improve disabled access at our railway stations. Within this constituency, we have two railway stations which do not have full access to them. So I would be working hard to achieve that if I was elected. And my final pledge, if I was elected, would be to be supporting our town centres um, to ensure, again, that our local communities have more input. And really, that is... That's key to a lot of my election campaign is really that we have to be given local people in local communities a voice. And as we move on from the pandemic, it's very important that everybody in Scotland is focused on recovery. We're not going to be talking about the constitution. We're going to be talking about recovery and taking Scotland forward on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll then move on to Julie McDougall, Scottish Labour Party. Thank you. Um, I'm standing uh, for Scottish Labour because I believe it is time for change in Scotland um, and particularly a time for change in Fife. We are offering a national recovery plan which will rebuild our education services, our health, it will create jobs and tackle climate change um, and rebuild our communities. So we now need to pull together more than ever um, and make sure that we begin to recover together um, from the pandemic. Um, as I've already said earlier, um, I believe that everyone has a contribution to make um, and in some way, and we need to make sure that the support is available to people to enable them to make that contribution. Um, as we go through the recovery, we do need to rebuild the society, our society, our economy, our NHS Fife. Um, and my priorities, if elected in May, will be to work very closely with local schools, with colleges, trade unions, local businesses, and work collectively and create long-term sustainable opportunities for all. Um, I want to work collectively with these organisations such as Fife Equalities uh, Centre and other organisations and cross-party to ensure that we can deliver the best for the people of Fife. And it's only by working together from the grassroots up that we can rebuild our communities and build a more inclusive and fair society. Um, I will be a visible and I will be an accessible MSP in Fife. And I'm a person of conviction and I hope you will put your vote to Labour um, for both votes. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll then move on to Alan Beale, Scottish Liberal Democrats. Thanks, Alan. Thanks for um, inviting me here. Um, yeah, there's been no shelter for a pandemic. It's changed things for everyone, everywhere but the impact did not land equally. Those who face discrimination and equality are often forced to bear the heaviest weight. For example, disabled and those from ethnic minorities encountered disproportionate health impacts. But by building up a health service and giving more power locally, we think we can resolve some of these issues. Um, I've spoken over the course of this uh, evening about how we boost mental health provision, really bring it up for all the different people and groups we've been speaking about. Um, you can see how we want our education reforms would help boost education as well. Um, I haven't spoken about business rates, but that could reform streets like and revive high streets like Kikadi by changing business rates. So there's less to pay for high street retailers. Um, and again, we've had 14 years of SNP rule and things are not getting better. We need to have a change and we need to have um, different governance. And we think the Lib Dems are the way of doing that. Um, both votes would help us to implement some of these policies that I've been speaking about. Um, we've got some great policies that will make Scotland better, greener and fairer, as well as being more prosperous. So I would urge you to use both your votes for the Lib Dems on May the 6th. Thanks. Thank you so much. We'll then move on to our final statement of this evening, uh, David Torrance, the Scottish National Party. Can I say once again, thank you for your invite tonight. I'm going to stand on my record for working with local communities, individuals, groups, third sector, volunteer sector and businesses. Over the last 10 years, I've committed my soul and heart to helping every person in my constituency. Um, and it just shows in the number of people who turn up at uh, surgeries or um, telephone surgeries now as we're helping them, um, that I am so easily accessible. 
We have helped over 9,000 people in the last five years, which is incredible. Um, so for that, that's a huge commitment to every individual who is going to vote in the, in the May 6 elections. Um, and that's why I'm asking for your support. I'm asking for two votes for uh, the SNP, um, both votes the SNP, because our record as a government is a good one. We've been progressive. You just need to see the number of policies that are out there. Too, too many to mention, um, but have been very successful out there in our local economy and in the whole sector across Fife. And you just need to take social housing for one. And I'll give an example. In the last, the last uh, administration, it was in government before us, built six council houses. We have built thousands upon thousands because we stopped the sales. We have brought affordable housing to the people that I represent. And you just need to see new developments across here. And the diversity um, that the government has brought also. And when you look at what we have done as well with some of the, the laws that we have brought in, a real equality has been 30 brought seconds. Um, by a government. And I'll, and I'll give it to you here, working in partnerships with other parties in the parliament. We have been so progressive as a parliament. And that's why I'm asking for your support and for the SNP support in your second vote um, in May 6, because we have a, a real good track record. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that's us now at the end of this hustings this evening. I would just like to say a big thank you to our audience, um, the candidates themselves, the Fife Centre of Equalities team and volunteers who worked incredibly hard to organise this event online. As you know, it's a little bit more different than what we're used to. Everyone who sent in their questions and, and those who could not make it this evening. And then just before we move on to the exit poll, I thought I'd pop in and say a big thank you to Sarah for chairing this and hosting it this evening. Um, I know this is the first time she's done it, but she's done an absolutely fantastic job in keeping things going, making sure everyone's questions were answered. And yeah, it's been a great help. Thank you so much for doing this for us. It is much appreciated. Thank you. Um, I think Elric's popping in with the results of the exit poll. Sorry, I was trying to get Mart Martin back on. He, he had the power cut, so he's, he's so he can't join us. So he can't vote. But I'll just post the, the, the polls as they were. So uh, there we go. This is, and I need to I need to flag again that this is only the result of who's in the room right now. Uh, it is not obviously more indicative than that. Uh, but the poll will stay open and roll for uh, anyone who's watching the record, well, recording afterwards and up to, up to the 6th of May for the election. Thank you again.